One thing you want to think about with children, especially young children, this is really important, you've got to get this right. When you have a, a baby, say, it's, you can't believe it. And you can't believe that you're going to be able to figure out what to do with this thing. Like, it's like, it's the most complicated thing you've ever had and no one has helped you figure out how to do it. So you're stuck. And then like three months later, it's like you can't really imagine what life would be like without that baby. And then it's sort of like, this goes on forever. That's how it feels, <laughs> but it doesn't. Right. You have little kids for four years. And if you miss it, it's done. That's it. So you got to know that. It's, you know, lots of things in life you don't get to do more than once. Now, obviously, you can have more than one child, but the, all I'm saying is that period between zero and four, zero and five, there's something about it that's really... It's like a peak experience in life, and it isn't much of your life, you know, because you think of it as a long time. It's not that long, man. Four years goes by so fast you can't believe it, and if you miss it, it's gone. So you miss it at your peril, and you don't get it back, and that's not... I know it with your career, you miss opportunities, you fall behind. This happens to women a lot. It's part of the reason for the pay gap, and it's really hard on women, you know, although no one knows what to do about it. So. And I would also say, well, you talk to each other, try to minimize your, your financial requirements to the degree that you can. See if there's other ways that you can generate income. But, and come to a consensual solution and try not to torture yourself with guilt with whatever you come up with. But do remember, because you know, you've got financial responsibilities and often you need two incomes and there's, there's no easy way of dealing with it. And for women, it often seems that no matter what they do, it's wrong, right? They stay home with the kids, it's wrong. If they go to work, it's wrong. If they do both, it's wrong. And, and I, I'm, like, I'm not being smart about that. Mm -hmm. That's rough, man. Mm -hmm. but, I, but having said all that, I would say again, you got little kids for four years. Don't miss it. You will regret it. First of all, I think that like human beings are social eaters and it's a it's a species characteristic. That's really weird Social eating is really weird animals don't share food like mother birds will feed their chicks, you know Right, but animals as a rule don't share food like if you're in a wolf pack and you bring down a moose It's like the most dominant Wolves eat their fill and then you know the less dominant wolves get to go in there and pick up the scraps Human beings aren't like that like we have this people like people who are alone don't eat well generally speaking. They're not even hungry mm -hmm. We have this unbelievably deep need to eat communally and it's a huge part of socialization because well You got to think that the regulation of eating is the, in some sense The only thing that that could compare with that would be the regulation of anger and the regulation of sex It's fundamental to culture. Yeah sit like a civilized human being Share the food properly, be good company, pay attention, learn to converse, be grateful for what you have to eat. Those are basic, basic, they're not even rules, they're deeper than rules, they're patterns of behavior. And you need that, so, so not having that shared meal, that's a real catastrophe. I think a third of British families now don't even have a dining room table. Yeah. It's really not good. Hey, m mom does everything for me. It's like, oh, really? You know, that's not so good because that means you can't do anything for yourself. You know, and so there's a rule for working with old people in, in old age homes. And the rule is don't do anything for the, for the uh, residents that they can do themselves. You think, well, that's pretty harsh. It's like, no, it isn't. You're, you're helping them retain their independence and their strength, right? Yeah. So you're not stealing their strength. And it's the same with little kids. Like, little kids should be doing whatever they can that's productive and useful as young as they can like if you have a two-year-old who's just toddling around you know you can get that two-year-old to set the table we used to have our kids do that it's really funny to watch because right? the table's like <laughs> foot and a half above their heads you know? right so you know you give the two-year-old a knife not a sharp one obviously that, that's a different psychological yeah, game you can save that for next time peterson yeah exactly uh -huh. you know and you say okay go put this on the table no they can't exactly put it beside the plate because they can't see right. the damn plate. Right. But they're, the kids are actually, if you're careful with them and you, you adjust your expectations to their level of developing expertise, that's called the zone of proximal development, by the way, they're, they're more than happy to, to comply because it helps them develop and move forward and they have a really powerful instinct for mm -hmm. that. 
you know, and with kids, it's also interesting if you, if you watch them very carefully, you can see when they're ready for the next task, you know. And then also the kids, you know, people talk a lot about self-esteem, which is a, it's very badly conceptualized self-esteem, because it, it's come to mean you should feel good about yourself, which I don't believe. I think you should feel good about who you, who you could be if you got your act together. <laughs> and you shouldn't be feeling so good about who you are now in your sorry state. It's like, what the hell, man? You're 17. Don't be feeling too good about yourself. Get your act together and see what you could be and feel good about your trajectory. Yeah. That's way different, but also your competence. And so like, even with little kids, is they know they're being taken care of. They have an existential debt to their parents. It's like if you allow them to be useful and encourage them to do things, then they get to pay off that existential debt. And then they can see that they're contributing members of even this small society. And it's no lie. It's like, hey, you know, when, when our daughter was, when my son was born, my daughter was about a year and a half old. And you can get pretty intense sibling rivalry at, with, with kids aren't separated by three years. Doesn't mean you should separate them by, by three years, but, but because the older kid is still pretty dependent. So you gotta watch that. So the first thing we did was, we talked to her about the new baby that was coming and we told her that that was gonna be her baby, you know, as well as our baby, that's your baby. And then we taught her to get a hug and we had her act that out. It's like, okay, when, when the new baby comes, there's gonna be times when your mom is preoccupied. You gotta say it in a way, three-year-old or one-and-a-half-year-old, something like that, was one-and-a-half, can understand, and that means acting it out and playing, right, like pretend play. But the message was, there'll be times when you're going to feel lonesome, and you have to come and get a hug. Well, so then we'd have her practice. It's like, let's play a game. Pretend you're lonesome. It's like, okay, now come and get a hug. Well, and so, okay, so fine. Then we had our new, our son, and we helped Michaela, my daughter, figure out how to take care of him. And you know, a one and a half year old can actually take care of a baby. They can watch the baby. And, and if the baby cries, they can come and tug on you, you know, and say the baby needs, you know, whatever the baby needs. And so then, well, then the, the older child also gets a set of privileges because of that. It's like, well, you're older, you don't get to be an infant anymore. That's kind of sucks because mom's with you all the time. It's like, what do you get in exchange? You get some more freedom, you get some more status. You get some more power. It's like, it's a good trade-off. That's why you want to grow. That's mm -hmm. why you want to become an adult. You don't want to steal that from people. It's, you steal their, it's, that's, Hans, that's, that's the witch in Hansel and Gretel who fattens up the kids and eats them. It's like, come here to my lair, little one. You know, <laughs> it's gingerbread and candy. Yeah. You won't have to do anything. I'll take care of you. Uh. It's like, yeah, run away from that person. You've got to distinguish between kinds of trust. There's naive trust. That's the trust you have when you're naive, surprisingly, mm -hmm. when you don't think that anyone is ever out to hurt you. And if you're naive and you get hurt, then you get traumatized in proportion to the hurt and the naivety. Not advisable. You don't raise your children to be naive. Mm -hmm. in, in Sleeping Beauty, in the Disney film, yeah. the uh, king and queen, they're older, they've been trying to have a child, they finally have one, Aurora. Like, she's everything to them. They have a christening party for her. They don't invite the evil queen. And you think, well, of course they don't. Who invites the evil queen to the birthday party? It's like, you gotta invite the evil queen to your kid's life, because otherwise they don't know that life is hard, and they don't know that they can prevail through that. And so what happens to Sleeping Beauty is the first time she's disappointed, as soon as she grows up, as soon as she hits 16, pricks her finger, a little bit of blood, she wants to be unconscious because mm -hmm. she can't tolerate it. She's been so protected, she can't tolerate life. It's like so, well, so you want to make sure that your kids are, that your kids are exposed to, to, to experiences that push them and, and, and stretch them as much as you possibly can. I guess that's part of the competence thing we were talking about yeah. too. One of the things that modern parents don't understand, and I think this is because of the exceptionally permissive ethos of the 1960s where when we developed this idea that everything that society does to children is bad mm -hmm. and so don't damage your children like by putting restrictions on them it's like that's just that's so wrong that it's almost impossible it's why people shy away from kids because they don't understand that you don't have to put up with any unpleasant you don't have to put up with any unnecessary unpleasant nonsense from children it's not necessary it's interesting. So the, you could almost argue that the, the 60s led to exactly what you're talking about. These kids who then were taught to be afraid of everything, they become a mess. They're the parents of now, and that's probably in part why they're having less children, or at least talking about 
family and children in a different way. Well, and there's there's also less trust in the structure of the family because the divorce rate has proliferated. And it's hard, like there's a woman in our department, um, in the psychology department, she showed that if you if you interfere with the maternal relationship between rats and their pups, because rat children are called pups, that you can see the detrimental effects of that disruption three generations later. Wow. Right, yeah, so you know, you disrupt those early bonds, you disrupt the familial structure, that echoes, it takes a, it's like an oral tradition in some sense, you know, because being a good mother is not just something that you're taught, it's something that you kind of have in your bones if you were mothered properly. Mm -hmm. Like my father was an excellent father, especially when I was a little kid. He really spent a lot of time with me. And uh, I used to love it when he came home. And, and like I have a natural affinity for little kids. And I, I do believe it's, it's in large part, that's why. It's because I just know how to react with them. And it's be, I do believe it's because of the way that I was treated when I was a little kid. You hmm. disrupt that, it's like lots of people don't trust themselves as parents, eh? Because they were hurt or they didn't have good role models or they don't trust the familial structure. And so, you know, that all, that all makes people afraid. I don't think it's the content of the electronics that's the problem. I think it's the fact of the electronics. And I think the danger to kids is they don't engage in pretend play, rough and tumble and pretend play. So even when I had kids, which is quite a while ago now, um, you know, the electronic media wasn't so, we didn't have phones, cell phones. So, uh, but I'd often take my kids to other couples who had kids and they'd put all the kids in front of the TV and have them watch a movie. It's like, fair enough, it was a Disney movie, maybe it was a good movie. There's nothing wrong with the movie. But there is something wrong with the fact that the kids aren't wrestling, that they're mm -hmm. not using their imagination to figure out how to turn, a, like, to turn some weird object into a doll or a fire truck, or making a blanket fort and playing out the roles of the family. Like, those things are crucially important. We know that, the rough and tumble element, which is one of the things that fathers do with their kids. Like, it's really useful to play physically with your kids uh -huh. because that's how they learn what doesn't hurt and what does hurt, you know, because I've played with little boys who haven't had a father and they're often awkward in their play. They don't know how to react to me first, so they're intimidated. And so one of the things you do with a father is like you stretch your kid out and you, yeah. you know, you, you <laughs> tap them and, and poke them so that they, they know what play is and they know what, what hurts and what doesn't and you let them hit and wrestle with you so they can figure out that they shouldn't put their thumb in your eye and, it's kind of how they learn to dance too, yeah. and to get coordinated. And so fathers really like to play with their children and mothers are often somewhat apprehensive about that because the guys generally will play rougher with the kids than the, than the women will. That's a generalization for all of you who think I'm being sexist, <laughs> but, but it's, the behavioral data is pretty clear. Yeah. But it, it puts the kid in their body and gives them a kind of confidence. And then when they're out on the playground and they've got that play circuit already activated, a new kid will come up who's like that and they can just make a gesture at each other and bang, they're off playing. Yeah. But the kids who don't have that, it's like other kids will come up, make a play gesture too, nothing happens, they leave and go find a different kid. Do you think uh, that there's a, a right number of children to have as you're saying that? That popped in my head. I, I come from I don't I'm think one oldest. is a good number. And the reason for that, now, if you have one child, it's like I'm not saying, well, that's terrible, man. Like, what the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> right. I, that's hard. Yeah. to have one child because children first of all socialize each other and they amuse each other and so we found so we had two kids and then my wife also took care of a couple of neighbor kids that actually in some ways made things easier because the kids will just run off and amuse themselves and then what you have to be is around when they have a problem but they don't want you around and you don't necessarily want them around you have adult things to do right with one child you've got the problem of having to amuse the child all the time and the child has the problem of not having siblings to hash things out at, at a peer-to-peer -peer level. And I think that maybe that one of the reasons the overprotected child, you know, going to university phenomena has emerged is because children are now mostly produced by older couples, so who are more intent on doing everything right for them, but they also don't have enough siblings. So they're not getting sort of, you know, they're like puppies that haven't had enough rough and tumble play with other puppies. Yeah. And they're really like that. I mean, and, and that's not good. We know from the animal developmental studies, like even with rats, 
um, social animals don't do that well unless they have peers to get into it with, you know. And a lot of socialization takes place between peers. And so, so I would say two kids minimum because, well, then, then you have kids and they can amuse each other. And maybe three is nice and, you know, but one is, one is, I do not believe that one is easier than two. I don't believe that. Number five, do not let your children do anything that makes you dislike them. This has sort of been a through yeah. line to at least the beginning part of our conversation. Yeah, well, the first thing is it's the monster thing, like the Beauty and Beast thing. You are not a good guy, and you will take revenge on your children if they misbehave. You think, oh, no, I, I like my children. It's like other people might not like them. Maybe they don't behave very well, you know, and you think you like them because you're a saint, but you're not. And you will take revenge on those children if they do things that make you dislike them. So you're in the grocery store and you've got a four-year-old and the four-year-old's pretty smart. It's checking you out all the time, you're like pro poking <laughs> you and prodding you and seeing what's there. Because that's what little kids do. They're not that verbal. You could compare their behavior in some ways to pack animals like dogs, which is why they like dogs and get along with dogs. They understand each other, you know. And so they're testing you out. And so they have a temper tantrum in the store and you don't know what to do about it. What you do, your kid has a temper tantrum in the store. You pick up the child, you go outside with them, you stand them up somewhere and just let them have it. Let them have the temper tantrum. It's like, they'll get sick of it soon enough. Go somewhere boring and dull and say, well, have at her, man. Then the kid's done, you say, we're going to stand right here till you decide that you're going to behave. The child knows what that means. It's like, you're going to behave or we're just going to stand here. It's like. Fine, okay, you don't do that. The child has a temper tantrum. It's the third one, you know, and you're embarrassed, you're turning red, everyone's sweating, everyone's looking at you like you're a horrible parent. It's like really unpleasant. Think, oh, I love my child, I like my child. It's like, no, you don't. That's a lie. You go home, the kid's forgotten all about it, you know. They go in their room, they make a little drawing, they're all thrilled, they come out and show it to you. And maybe they did a really good job, you know. Maybe they're even a little guilty about having the damn tantrum. But you, man, you're not happy. And you think, yeah, that's nice. And you go back to whatever useless thing you're doing. And you think, I got that little bastard. Uh -huh. And you think, no, I wouldn't think that. It's like, yeah, wrong. You would. Wrong. Not only would you think it, you would act it out. And if you don't think that that's true, then you don't know yourself very well. And so you've got to think, that little kid is little and powerless. Well, not as powerless as you might think. But <laughs> fundamentally, you got the upper hand. And you've got the proclivity for tyranny deeply rooted in you. And so... You better be real careful around that child. I, I used to tell my kids, you know, when I was not in a good mood, say, like, it would be better if you were in your room. Mm -hmm. And they didn't mind. They knew what it meant, you know. They were very young. They could understand that. It's like, I, you're a fine kid, you know. Pat, pat, pat. I'm not in a good mood. Things are likely to be unpleasant. Why don't you just go play in your room for a while? It's like, way they went. They knew how to play in their room, you know, because I didn't want them being around me when I wasn't being going to be a good guy. Yeah. And so, and kids, they, they know they can handle that, man. They can't handle lies. They can handle that sort of truth, no problem. And so, like, I, both my wife and I, we were very careful. It's like, when, when we're starting to not be happy with the kids, with one kid or the other, it was time to have a chat and figure out what it was that had gone off the rails and how we were going to fix it so that we were, like, thrilled to have that kid around. And that's the thing about kids is... You can be thrilled to have them around. Not always. You're tired. You're hungover. Like, you've had a bad day. The kid's cranky. Like, I'm not saying this is utopia. It's not. That's not the point. But the point is, though, you, you can manage your relationship with your kids, and you can have an honest relationship with them, and then it will be the best relationship with anybody you've ever had in your life. And I, I can say that with some certainty, because, like, I had a rough time with my daughter because she was very, very, very ill for a long time. It was really bad for mm -hmm. like seven years. It's still touch and go, but it was, she was in excruciating agony for two straight years, mm -hmm. which I can't believe she even did it because like three hours of pain that's intense, that's rough. Two years, it's like maybe you don't get through that, you know? Mm -hmm. But we had a good relationship during, and thank God, if, we, if our family hadn't been well put together by that point, it would have been, it would have taken tragedy and turned it into hell. And so we had a rough time for those years, and still it was good. You know, and that's saying something, because, well, she lost her hip and her ankle during that period. They were both replaced when she was 16, and so she was walking around on two broken legs for two years. It was wow. brutal. But 
our fa- like my son, for example, during that period of time, and like hats off to him. He was only 14, you know, when he wanted to be out with all his friends. He stuck around. He supported her. He never complained about it. He never complained about the fact that he didn't get the attention he should have got. He was there like a bloody rock. And, my, and his sister relied on him a lot, loves him to death, partly because of that. It's like, that was a good thing, and it was because of that foundation. You have a post on Quora in which you encourage all children to incur skateboarding injuries. <laughs> I have a book coming out in 2018 called 12 Rules for Life, An Antidote to Chaos. And one of the chapters in there is from that Quora posting, and it's called Don't Bother Children When They're Skateboarding. And it's sort of associated with what I had said earlier about parkour, for example, is that you know kids need to go out and push themselves against danger because that's what life is, is pushing yourself against danger. And, and when you see kids doing things that are dangerous but spectacular, then it, you kind of have a moral obligation to back the hell off and let them experiment with their own mortality because you can't keep them safe. The best thing you can do is make them able and courageous. And, and I would say that that's a more difficult lesson, generally speaking, for mothers to learn than for fathers to learn. And that was Freud's fundamental observation. But it's, it's absolutely crucial. And so I've seen kids do, I mean, you know, you can obviously be a fool on a skateboard, although the distinction between being a fool and developing yourself is not as clear as people might like to imagine. And, and when kids are out there with no helmet and doing dangerous things, it's like there's a part of me that, of course, is very worried about it, but there's another part of me that admires it very much because they're practicing what they need to practice in order to cope with the world.